Hello, welcome to Podfix Galore. I'm your horrible online reader, Gold Skype. I read out loud fanfictions for you busy bees, free of charge and no strings attached. Today I will continue reading the Silmarillion fic by Aeolian Sons from an archive of our own called The Rescue Party, Chapter 4. I hope you can at least try to enjoy my voice and I will try my best for you with the equipment available to me. On with the show. Chapter 4 the ladies. Erwin eyed her husband's captain with no small amount of suspicion. Where is he? she demanded. Conway swallowed nervously. He said he was going to the florist. The florist? Erwin questioned, not bothering to hide her skepticism. Binarfin rarely purchased flowers preferring instead to spend quiet afternoons away from the hustle of Tyrion, picking wildflowers himself for whatever the occasion might be that had need of them. Yes, to get flowers for Inguion. Erwin's frown deepened. Something was afoot in Tyrion this morning. Although she had not yet ventured outside the walls of her residence, Inguion had returned to her with an angry bump on his head, muttering about being attacked by one of his own people. But Erwin wasn't aware of any visiting Vanyar outside of Inguion himself and his personal guard. <clears throat> and then, as she was searching an empty guest room for firm pillows to give to Ingua's son so he might be comfortable while he rested, she heard a scream of terror rebounding off the mountains. This was immediately followed by the pounding of horse hooves and a clatter of metal dragging on stone. Erwin had raced to the door to go to see what in air was going on outside, throwing it open to reveal a shocked Captain Conway. The dark-haired warrior had one arm raised as he were getting ready to knock. Erwin immediately grabbed him and pulled him inside. Now they both were standing in the empty room, Erwin with an arm full of pillows and a head full of questions that needed answers. What's going on? Where's my husband? He's normally back before I even wake. Uh, well, my lady. And that was all that Erwin needed to hear to have her suspicions confirmed. Conway was a good soldier, but he was young and still swung between confidence and poorly hidden anxiety when he found himself in uncomfortable situations. She raised an eyebrow to prompt him to continue speaking, her deep blue eyes staring into his dark ones. He deflated. Well, the king didn't have his horse, and his clothes had uh, grass stains on them, and he told me to give you this. He stumbled through his words, and held out a very familiar thin gold chain, on which hung a simple but intricate key. Horror seeped into Erwan's veins, and her blood turned to ice. Slowly, she took the golden key out of the young captain's hand and worked to ensure her face did not betray her emotions. Thank you, Conway, she said flatly. You are good to tell me these things. I am I am worried for King Arafinwa. Erwin put a gentle hand on his shoulder. Worrying is a pointless exercise. Please, give these pillows to Prince Inguion. He is a few rooms down. Conway took the pillows and bowed, leaving Erwin to her thoughts. She stared at the key. Erwin knew that Finarfin had worn it around his neck ever since the darkening. This is for you, he had said, when they lay in each other's arms the night before he went to the judgment on Mohan Aksar. Erwin had been so scared for him then. While her heart had felt raw anger and grief over the death of her kin, above all other emotions, had been an inescapable fear that the Valar would not permit Finarfin to stay, or that the people would not welcome him back. And in the beginning, many did not. The names they called her beloved were cutting and unfair. Did not the shattered remains of their people realize that he was not Feanor, that he was not Morgoth, but grief called for a scapegoat, and Finarfin was an easy target. If I die, if the people cannot stand the look of my face and stone me in the streets. No, Erwan had whispered, wrapping her arms around him. Listen, my love, if they do, 
Or if the Vala find me guilty. Or Moringotta comes again. Take this key and open the jewelry box. You know the one. Suddenly, there was a sound of footsteps pounding down the hallway, jostling this one maiden from her thoughts. Erwin! Erwin, where are you? A strong voice called. Merdanel! Erwin cried when she stepped out of the door, running to her friend. She grasped Mahtan's daughter in a tight hug. Oh, Merdanel, I fear my husband has gone and done something terribly stupid. Merdanel laughed. So you have felt it too. You and I are not gifted in foresight. But I think, with our husbands, there is an exception. She paused then, likely noticing how shaken Erwin appeared. My friend, what's wrong? Wordlessly, Erwin held out the key on its chain. Ara always wore this after the darkening. He said I was to take it if he ever should go to Mondos. But yet, just now, Conway has given it to me. She took a calming breath fighting to banish the dark image that had wormed itself into her mind. An image of her beloved bleeding helplessly on the road, a mob cursing him for abandoning his principles to follow a madman. She shook her head, valiantly attempting to banish such an old nightmare from her mind. He cannot be dead, he claimed. Nerdana laughed and shook her head. Oh no, he's not dead. Not yet. Try all somewhere. She said, and there was a strange spark in her grey eyes. Erwan gave Nerdanel a small smile. Trust Fenner's wife to be so confidently unconcerned. It was her level-headed pragmatism that balanced out the rest of the family's drama. The silver-haired Eloth closed her eyes then and attempted to connect with Finarfin through their marriage bond. Her attempts were met with strong fortifications around her husband's mind, Great walls that shut her out like a door slamming in the face. What in the name of... Anna was shielding their actual marriage bond? He made her relive those dark memories, think that he might be dead. And then he had the gall to hide from her and not explain anything? Erwin's unease melted into righteous fury. She was going to drag that good-for-nothing piece of kelp back to their room by his golden hair and beat some sense into his handsome, empty head. What was he thinking? Giving her this key as if he were dead and then running away without a word? Nerdanel grinned on seeing the angry steam practically rising off Erwin's body. Not dead? Oh, most certainly not dead. Can you reach him? No, the half-wit is shielding himself from me. The absolute Scoundrel! The baseball rogue! Who is he to bring such horrid visions back to me with this damn key, as if something terrible has happened? She then paused and looked at her friend, noting how she still wore a dirty apron and was smudged with clay from her studio. Say, Nerdanel, what do you know? Why are you standing here all smug? And the redhead smiled in an almost feral way. I too tried Osanwe with my husband. The dead in Mondas have no contact with the living, so I should not have been able to feel him at all. But he was there, also shielding his mind from me with walls of fire. And Erwin felt the blood drain from her face. What? She voiced out the only word that she could put together at the moment. Fernara was back from Mondas? You heard me. My husband lives. I have no doubt that the chaos of this morning can be directly linked back to him. I also assume noble Ara's shielding has to do with Fenera as well. How is that possible? It has been centuries since you felt him pass. The strange glint in Nerdanel's eye gleamed brighter. That is true. But do you know who hasn't been dead for centuries? Nola Finua. Nola would have just gone to Mondas yesterday when Anaire had felt the bond snap. But if Nola Finua was in Mondas and Fyodor was in Mondas too, oh, poor Anaire. Namo has somehow foolishly enough put Nola and Nara together. He must not be as well acquainted as we are with the disasters that always follows that particular combination.
Nerdanel declared, as if giving a lecture. The two of them escaped, Erwin answered matter-of-factly. And then they went and got Ara involved. So the question remains, why the shielding? What are they up to that they don't want us to know about? I think that key holds the answers. Nerdanel nodded to the gold chain in her sister-in-law's hand. What does it go to? Erwin sighed. A jewelry box. But I don't know what is inside. Nerdanel tossed her wild hair over her shoulders, her shining still. I bet it's a circlet. It would be just like Ara to make sure his people were in good hands before he went and did something... Thin one. He wants you to be queen. And before Erwin could respond, Nerdanel had grabbed her hand and was running down the ornate hallway towards Erwin's bedroom. If it's a circlet, I want you to throw it at your husband's head. Erwin secretly hoped it wasn't, but Nerdanel had an incredible track record at being right. The two of them skidded to a stop before an intricately carved double doors to Erwin and Finarfin's suite. Well, if you are right again, then we should have Anida throw it. She has the best aim of the three of us. And she pushed open the doors and strode to the dresser on which sat the beautifully carved box. Maybe it's just a bottle of liquor, something to hinder our ability to find them and demand answers. Nerdanel proposed that Erwin inserted the key and opened the lid. No, you were right the first time, she declared with a sigh, lifting up the most beautiful silver crown she had ever seen. It glimmered in the mid-morning light, sparkling like the waves, the pearls, aquamarines and sapphires adorning it make it look like a jewel of the sea. Left in a box lay a note written in an eloquent hand. Erwin picked it up with her other hand. My dearest beloved, if you are reading this, then I surely have gone to my long rest in Mondos, or otherwise can rule no longer. There is no one I trust more than you to lead our people. You have more honor, grace, and wisdom than the entire court combined. I therefore bequeath the crown to you. Live long and well, my swan maiden, my beautiful queen. With love forever, Ara. Despite her righteous rage, Erwan still almost felt like crying. Damn her husband and his sentimental melodramatic heart. Nerdanel reached over her shoulder and plucked the note out of her hand, reading it. It's good. Very good. It lacks the sappiness of Fianna's poetry, but still sounds quite touching. Unfortunately, it is also complete garbage, the red-haired elf declared, putting the note back in the box. Don't be distracted by pretty words. These Finwans have a way with them. Erwin chuckled. Yeah, of course. Don't worry, Nerdanel. I will not be waylaid by sweet notes. Good. Nerdanel then took the circlet, inspecting it. I think if we aim it right, we will be able to hit all three of them with one throw. All three of them? An inquirer's voice asked. They turned to see Anaira standing in the doorway, wearing a blue dress with her hands on her hips. Nara, Nolo, Anara. Grieve no longer. Your husband was not even in Mondo's a day. Nerdanel replied simply. What? Anara asked, looking at her as if she had grown a second head. Go on. Reach out to him. You will find that he's alive and well. Fingolfin had not thought to fortify his mind from his marriage bond. It was difficult to think of such things when one was chasing Fjallnar across Valinor, trying to keep casualties to a minimum. Nala? A shocked voice echoed in his mind. Orcs bit! Damnable hells of iron! He had occasionally felt his wife touch in Beleriand, but the distance had been far too great to allow any actual communication. And now, galloping down the road, bareback on a draft horse, following Fëanora and the strangely dark-haired Finarfin, he really was not at all prepared for a mental conversation with his wife. Anaire, he murmured mentally, not knowing how else to respond. Perhaps he should have ignored her. But that was easier said than done. And by the Valar, he did truly miss her. There was a moment of nothingness. The base great hooves thundering down the path. 
then a sudden wave of pure, unadulterated rage. Finnegolfin's headache was so great he saw stars. Insufferable moron! How are you alive? Where are you? Finnegolfin struggled to stay on the horse. My love, it's okay. I met my brother in Mandos, and we made it back here to Valinor, but I cannot stay. Findegana and Turgana are still alive. Fingolfin was breathing heavily. Osanwe was not meant for conversations like this. I must help them. And then he summoned what strength he had to encase his mind in strong fortifications. Finarfin, always so aware of everything around him, looked back at him from his seat behind Fjallnar. Nala! He called above the rushing wind. Are you okay? Fingolfin urged his horse faster wishing once more he had not put the harnesses on yet. He owed this gentle creature a lifetime of apples. Anaida knows about me, he called, but Finarfin only nodded. I felt Aravan's touch as well. I left her the crown. Fingolfin wanted to yell at his brother for raising Aravan's suspicions like that, but he very well understood that the mad gallop through Tyrion wasn't the most clandestine of escapes. Their spouses weren't going to know anyway. Finarfin turned to Fjallnar, no doubt yelling something in his ear. Nana says we need to reach the, the forest that borders the beach just outside Alcolonde. Fingolfin shut his eyes and prayed that they had an early enough head start. Anaira stared at her two sisters by marriage, looking at them both in the eye. I need my swords, she proclaimed. Nola shut me out but not before he revealed that one, he's alive, and two, he's planning to run back to Endora with Ara and Nara. And he wasn't even going to say goodbye! Nardinal reached out and grasped her forearm in a warrior salute. A husband hunt? You got my great sword. And Erwin flung her long hair over her shoulder. And Hero thought our little sparring sessions would be a waste of time. I got my father's trident still. Although... Do you think I should stick with the sword? Absolutely, Absolutely not. not. Nerdanel and Anaira replied at the same time. You're like Osa himself with that thing. You shall not relinquish it for a simple sword, Anaira ordered. All right, add my trident to the mix then. Nerdanel nodded. Very well, I will meet you fine ladies at the fountain. Bring your horses and armor. She pointed at the circle. And that too. Anaira... Erwan here claims you have the best aim. And while you're no poor shot, Anada left. Erwan, she proclaimed, hitting her friend on the back. Stop it with this modesty. If you can throw a trident, you can throw a circlet. You aren't even going to ask why we are throwing it? Anada shrugged. It's obvious. Just don't injure Nala too badly. I am the one who shall deal with him fully. End of chapter 4 Stay tuned!